Living a life in full is a conversation you always wanted to have with that person who gave an amazing TED Talk, or the author of one of your favorite books, or that inspirational Olympian you always wanted to know more about. It's graduate-level conversations with those making a difference in the world and in the lives of others. This show brings you new ideas and approaches so that you can live a life in full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This episode is sponsored by our new video course, How to Publish in the New Millennium, from scientific journals to bestsellers. It's an asynchronous course offering, so you can watch it when it's convenient for your schedule. It's based on eight video lessons and provides three hours of material with new concepts, stories, and examples, and it includes several attempts at humor. You'll learn about the best ways to submit a manuscript to a peer-reviewed journal, the mechanics of book contracting, what publishers are looking for, how to evaluate and negotiate a contract, royalties, advances, copyright, and ownership, why to never first submit a manuscript to a publisher, when you need an agent and when you don't, and the differences between publishers. You'll learn about ebooks, print on demand, Amazon's Create Space and KDP programs, and other non traditional approaches to publishing, along with how to tell if a platform is of high quality or not. We do a deep dive into marketing, how to create media kits and what goes into them, along with examples, how to create a great Amazon author page, how book signings work, and how to be invited to do library talks and the economics of both along with developing speaking engagements, promotional tours, and being a podcast guest, as well as a number of other publicity aspects. We cover blogging and provide additional resources to help you in crafting your work and making it better. This is a rich, fun, and fact-filled course that covers everything you need to know from a practical and actionable perspective. It's for anyone wanting to get their written work into the world, be it academia, popular media, or both. Join the master class in getting published. To learn more, please visit tinyurl.com backslash getting published course. Thanks. Welcome to another episode of Living a Life in Full. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Stout. Dr. Mohammed Hakmal is the former chief of public health for Afghanistan, where he developed a series of groundbreaking programs. He has experience in leading national and international programs and organizations as a regional technical consultant, project director, country medical coordinator, lecturer, and researcher for almost two decades. He has expertise in the fields of program management, capacity building, maternal and child health, infectious diseases, research, and policy and strategy development. He has led the implementation of large-scale development programs for the World Bank, USAID, Gavi, the Italian government, the UN, the European Commission, and others at the national, provincial, district, facility, and community levels. Dr. Hakmal was a Shevening scholar and, and, and in, uh, sorry, and in recognition of his groundbreaking initiatives, he has received the Afghanistan National Public Hero Award twice. He's a medical doctor by training and also holds master's degrees in business administration, public health with a focus on epidemiology, and global health and development from the universities in South Asia and the UK. Dr. Hakmal is fluent in English, Pashto, Farsi, and Arabic. Currently, he's a lecturer at the University of London, and as we were talking off mic, I believe he's got a new position lined up at uh, Cambridge. And he's also involved in a number of research projects based in the UK and serves as a columnist at Arab News and has a forthcoming new book. Welcome to the show, Hakmal. It's great to have you on. Thank you very much. A uh, pleasure, uh, pleasure is mine. You know, I have just a very minimal connection with Afghanistan, so I have kind of like a, a lot of questions, as I'm sure a lot of our audience members do. But uh, a number of years ago, I worked with a place called Eureka Research and was invited to work on the development of a think tank with an entity called Q Holdings back in the day. I don't even know if those things are still around. And I guess my current awareness with the recent events of uh, the, the U.S.'s withdrawal is kind of, you know, here uh, in North America kind of brought that to the to the fore. But perhaps as a place to start, you could tell us about growing up there, your childhood. I know that uh, it was pretty challenging. So might that be a good place to start? Well, uh, thank you very much once again, you know, for having me uh, in your program. Uh, yes, uh, as you mentioned, you know, like I 
uh, I'm born in Afghanistan, originally from, I'm from Afghanistan, but then we left Pakistan in 1980 uh, as a small child and I completed also my school, you know, uh, uh, high school in Pakistan. And then I returned back to Afghanistan in 1996 and I started my medical school in Kabul. I was a medical student uh, association head during the previous Taliban government from 1996 up to 2000, 2000. And then I graduated in 2003 from Kabul University. So I had, I had, you know, I was refugees in Pakistan. Then in, inside Afghanistan, we because of these challenges, we were also among these internally displaced people. Originally, I'm from Logar, but I was living in Kabul. So most of the time I was far from family just to pursue the educations. And I was just traveling, you know, following, you know, my school, wherever I was, supposed to go and i was happy you know to take that risk i can imagine and i i've read uh, doing some background that uh, at the refugee camps you were pretty resourceful as a as a child or as a young man to uh, kind of do some entrepreneurial kinds of things to be able to uh, get funding and things can you tell us a little bit about what uh, your ingenuity was in that area uh that's absolutely true because it it was not only me, there was also, let's say, you know, thousand other uh, refugees, uh, specifically, specifically in those children, you know, that they had no resources, uh, either from family or also from the government, so also from the international community. So I was also among those children. I was selling water when I was six years old. And, and I was also feeding, you know, helping my family and specifically on weekend which was regularly Friday and Pakistan for refugees, you know, so every Friday I was working. And apart from Friday, I was also selling, you know, like sometimes vegetables, sometimes fruit, you know, most of the time water, uh -huh. which did not re uh, need like, you know, more investment, you know, so it's easy, you know, to buy some ice and put it in a, uh, a basket and then sell it water, you know. So that was my part-time job. And I was enjoying that one, I think, you know, for very long time until I completed my school. Wow, good for you. Well, what was it that drew you into medicine? And can you tell us what that journey was like? Well, uh, because uh, and I, when I completed my uh, high school in Pakistan, so then uh, I also uh, passed exam, you know, mm -hmm. for the entrance exam, you know, to medical school in Pakistan, among those that are for these uh, refugees universities, specifically for the Afghan. So I was very fortunate, very fortunate, you know. I got the highest score among in the exam wow. for both universities. So one was, you know, from one mil one from one political party, the second was from other political party, you know, of me, somebody who was not well connected, you know, those political party. So I think it was very merit based, you know, selection, you know, I mm -hmm. got, I got the second in one university and fourth in another university. And then uh, unfortunately, again, in those uh, Afghan refugees university still, they were charged, they were charged, they just started, you know, charging, you know, fees and I could not afford that one. Then I came to Afghanistan and again, you know, when I attended that exam, you know, university entrance exam, I also got the highest score. And fortunately, I was accepted, you know, at uh, and another Afghan university, which is called Ningarhar Medical Faculty, you know, so so that was one of the best time in my life, you know, wow. to see, you know, having, you know, those all challenges and then get, you know, the chance, you know, to go to the medical school, because in Afghanistan, it was very tough to go because the set, the, there was very limited set, you know, I think it was, we, there was over 3000 people. Wow. that we attended the exam out of 3000 they were only uh, selecting you know like there was space for 50 Gosh. 50 wow so <laughs> i was very lucky you know and so after those challenges and limited resources in my life self sell, selling water or table or fruit living in a tent for very long time very long time and apart from that i remember i could not afford for a very long time to buy shoes and i was wearing all the time sandal <laughs> plastic sandal oh my gosh oh, so wow. uh, so with those sandal i enjoyed that life with sandal as well you know so i think that was the best time you know when i passed the exam and i got the chance you know to start my medical school in afghanistan 
And so later I was uh, shifted, you know, to Kabul University because we were thinking, well, Kabul is, you know, the capital of the country. And so Kabul will be the best one. And then that I also fulfilled the requirement, you know, to move, you know, from a, a regional, you know, medical university to the capital one. And then I, during the Taliban time, we had, again, you know, there was a big challenge mm -hmm. because during the previous Taliban government, between 1996 up to 2001, one. So there was no hostel for us. Normally in the Afghan government system, you know, so they are providing, you know, hostels and also education is free at university, in public university. Mm -hmm. But due to limited resources with the previous Taliban government, we were deprived of having, you know, most of to receive, you know, those public services, mm -hmm. including, you know, food or maybe, you know, even the electricity. We, we, we could not manage, you know, to have electricity. You know, we were just using, you know, very classic traditional uh, life and living, you know, in a very limited resources, you know, full of challenges again in Kabul University until I completed my, until the, with the, uh, let's say, with the support of the international communities that they came to Afghanistan, I think it was the 1990, uh, it was 2001, and then we started, you know, at least, you know, good life. And at least during the last two years of my medical stu uh, studies, you know, I was very lucky, you know, to have access, you know, to the, most of those public services mm -hmm. supported by the international community. Gotcha. I know that um, from our prior conversation that uh, there might be some areas that are sensitive. So I want to be very respectful of that. So there, um, if there, if I inadvertently ask something that you don't feel comfortable talking about, you know, just you know, feel free to to say that. That's perfectly fine. But I want to maybe shift into more recent times, like. Um, <clears throat> This isn't super recent, but um, you were, uh, as, as my research says, the chief of public health uh, there in uh, Afghanistan, did a lot of really impressive work there. What was it like at the start with uh, becoming the chief of public health? What kinds of things did you work on when you first got started? Well, let me tell you something very interesting, you know. So when I completed my medical school, uh, so I came to my uh, to to inform my mom, you know, that I completed my medical school and she was uh, like, she had, you know, big challenges. She was telling me, oh, my son, we don't have, you know, for tomorrow food. Mm. So you are graduated. So what will be the next step? Please go and start work as soon as possible and bring some food to our house. And just when I came and I think in the middle of the day, I left back, you know, and was just searching job, you know, mm. in Kabul. And even because of this, uh, because we had no uh, no internet facilities, no computer, and I just printed my CV and I was distributing, you know, on all those offices if they are really looking for someone. And when I saw somewhere MSF Medicine Sense Frontier, I thought maybe MS Medicine. Even I was not sure about this M. Uh -huh. So when I did the interview and I was selected, you know, as a hospital director in Central Highland, you know, in a very remote area that nobody was ready to go there, you know, and that road was like, you know, that road between the hospital that I was working for and also the capital of the provinces in Avon Kabul was most mostly closed for four months during the winter. Mm. So I spent the whole winter there and I started working with MSF. Wow. Then working with MSF always helped me to dream a little bit bigger uh, and to apply for different position and then gradually first nine months i was working as a hospital uh, uh, medical director you know in a district level then i moved to the provincial level as a clinical supervisor with a different organization then i moved as a project manager also with Khan health services it was also a kind of international organization in bamiyan then i uh, within 17 months, I got, you know, the highest other position as a country medical coordinator with uh, one of the French organization. And then I came to the Ministry of Public Health for the first time, it was 2008, when I started my job as a district health system manager, you know, so I started something, you know, for the district health system as a, from scratch. Wow. So I, like, an, I had that privilege, you know, to be considered <laughs> district health system founder in Afghanistan, Afghanistan between 2008 up to 2012. Once we completed that pilot project in Afghanistan, it was also World Bank funded project, one uh -huh. of the biggest project. And then I was, when the evaluation was done, the 
guy who was doing you know the research of the project he was a lecturer at the university of london we call it london school of hygiene and tropical medicine and his, he encouraged me to apply for some scholarship and do a master degree and either in us or in uk you know so that will also help you a lot you know to have a better understanding you know and then you can also uh, achieve you know the biggest dream that you have in your mind in afghanistan or outside once you have you know the international uh, education from the international recognized university so then i got the chevening scholarship funded by the uk uh, foreign ministry and i was also again very lucky there was i think 2500 people you know something like that one and i got you know the second position during the test and interview and application process. And I was lucky, you know, to come among those 15 tuning scholar, you know, to UK and did my master here. And then wow. when I returned back, I think, you know, then I had, you know, more capacities and also better capacities and also more opportunity to think about that one because of my connection with it international universities also back in Afghanistan. I also, I also did in you know, a very unique, you know, research project during my masters thesis project what was so it? i was just i was measuring hospital efficiency mm. to see because it was just 2013 and then 2014 was the year where the international community was supposed to leave the country so it was a big question for the afghan government because 75 percent of the afghan government you know health uh, health ministry was funded uh -huh. by the international community so we were just in a, in, in a depressed uh, situation we were we thought well if the international community leave the country and then they reduce you know their foreign aid how much that will also affect you know the health system so the best uh, ever you know research project that i selected was like responding you know to one of the public the government the health professional whoever was like looking you know to the health system was thinking you know so if the budget is reduced by 20 percent how much you know the uh, achievement will be reduced wow. so i found that well a1 uh, with 30 percent reduction of the health budget so still you know so that was the level of inefficiency so 30 percent wastage in the health budget at the hospital level we had in 34 provinces so and then i think that was one of the best uh, research project and then i was encouraged also by the Minister of Public Health also in Afghanistan to come and also present it to the donors. And then I also had a chance to present it also to the presidential palace. So that presentations in different area. And then fortunately, I was also invited to the US. I had that presentations in the annual conference at the American Public Health Associations, International Health Economic Association and Europe. And then I was also invited back at the University of London to present that research uh, project because it was responding, you know, to a question that everybody was just waiting for such kind of, you know, challenging, you know, things. So that challenging thing, I was enough lucky, you know, to, to do that one. So this further encouraged me you know, to think deeply. And then in Afghanistan, I was also able, you know, when I got the senior position, to uh, design several innovation in the health system, including Afghanistan Healthy Village Initiatives, Afghanistan One Dollar Project, where we were also focusing on the to reach unreachable people at the community level. Mm -hmm. So we thought the when I returned back to Afghanistan uh, and I completed the dissertation, the research project about hospital efficiency, we we also found that well, there might be also some area. Uh, in the health system, where uh, the projects, the you know, the national strategy and policy need to be uh, uh, revised because maternal mortality and child mortality was still high, mm -hmm. while the government or maybe the international community is funding enough budget, and then there was unspent budget. And so maternal mortality, child mortality was reduced between 2003 to 2011, 10. But later, specifically, maternal mortality was just increased again. And I had that privilege that I presented, you know, uh -huh. uh, as a unique presentation also at the uh, leadership of the Minister of Public Health donors, uh, most of the embassy representative, including US, UK, Canada. We told them, well, we need a kind of innovation in the health system to see some local you know locals initiatives local context solution how people in the area 
could properly use the services. Even if the services are there, people are not ready to use that one. We need to find out the reason and then tackle it, you know, through a local context solution. Because of the international policy strategy were very successful for the first uh, seven, eight years, but later we were not very helpful also in the health system. So then I designed you know, this Afghanistan Healthy Village and Afghanistan One Dollar Project. And then we were going beyond that one to see how to improve, you know, this maternal, uh, maternal health, child health, because maternal and child health was, you know, the main challenges in the health system. Uh, from 2003 up to 2011, 12, you know, that I was just focusing on that area. So that those innovations uh, help us a lot to That's save more life in the remote area. And then I was awarded, you know, uh, Health Hero Award even in UK as well, and then uh, in Afghanistan as well, you know, by different political parties, <laughs> parliament, and that was something, you know, that I was really grateful, you know, for those people that they could, they recognize also our achievement. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think those are well-deserved honors. So in making those kinds of impacts, was it around issues of um, <clears throat> nutrition or public health or vaccinations or what were the the kinds of interventions that you were able to institute that were you know creating these wonderful outcomes so there was uh, five main area uh, first was you know uh, like delay and receiving services so mainly you know maternal mother pregnant women and also children when they were also brought you know to receive the services in the health facility so they were coming at very late stage you know mm. so there was three delay first delay was like this uh, taking decision in their family to send that pregnant woman to be to delay to to deliver at the health facility level second delay was uh, coming you know from the house through the help to the health facility like transportations you know so that there was mm -hmm. difficulty in accessing you know the health facility third delay was even at the health facility level so sometime when they were coming at the midnight so there was no one at the health facility level at the clinical level oh. to receive that patient or maybe sometime you know the health facility staff were like absent so this was the 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 interim of you know accessing you know to the services third one we also had some uh, some of the because the, it was a kind of national package and so in some area where we know we have no you know even malaria cases based on the national package so that help, those health facilities were still receiving you know malaria treatment medicine for malaria mm -hmm. because this was included in their national package and then for nutrition uh, most of the time, like they were waiting, you know, for the patient to come and specifically those malnourished children or even if it is uh, anemic woman, you know, to come to the health facility and also receive the health services there. And what we did with our team, we did an assessment in the health facility and we spent, let's say, like maybe one month. Uh, in the those clinics and hospitals that we were trying, you know, to target, you know. Uh -huh the community and then we spend also around one and a half month with the community and we were asking them why they are not using the services so some of them they were telling us well if we go to the clinic so there is no mask we will miss our prey mm -hmm. so this was one of their concerns second one mm -hmm. They thought, well, when we are coming to the clinic, so some of the doctors in the clinic, they don't understand our language mm -hmm. because they are coming, you know, from the capital of the province where the doctors were like feeling more privileged, you know, being as a doctors, mm -hmm. not carefully listening, you know, to those local terminology. Mm -hmm. And then for the pregnant woman, uh, when I also asked, you know, the same question from the midwife. So midwife was telling me, well, my responsibility is to help pregnant women when they come to the clinics, but I'm not responsible, you know, to provide services at the community level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we also found the role of the uh, informal healthcare providers, you know, so unfortunately, informal healthcare providers, sometimes they were playing the kind of negative role and providing, you know, the better services. So, for example, traditional birth attendants that were not registered, you know, in the health system, they were still playing a, an important role also uh, and to conduct some of the deliveries. So when I visited, you know, those rooms where they were conducting the delivery, so that was full of infection, you know, so if the delivery is happening, you know, in a place which is full of infection, oh. then we cannot uh, expect, you know, like 
to be safe, you know, those right. pregnant women sure. even after delivery. Oh boy. And then it was the same. It, it was the same. Uh, so some of them, some of the patients that they were getting disappointed, you know, from the services that they were receiving from the clinics. So then they were going, you know, to the traditional healers and also to the religious scholar for the religious treatment. Mm -hmm. And I also had, you know, chance together with my team to visit also the religious scholar and we asked them, you know, which kind of treatment you are providing. So it was very strange and very unfortunate when I uh, heard from the religious scholar and he was saying that well i advise them for 40 days specifically for the pregnant women not to eat anything and only drink you know water Ooh. and so there was a piece of paper you know where he was also wrote uh, wrote some religious treatment you know and uh -huh. then put that uh, piece of paper in the water and also swallow it also and oh. drink that water wow. so for 40 day if a pregnant woman do not receive you know food then obviously you know this reason for the anemic and also yeah. under, uh, malnutrition oh. is also very Boy. common yeah. also. and uh, and it was also the same the role of the private pharmacy unfortunately in the remote area in afghanistan even if we go to today people are selling uh, medicine in their shops big shops in the same shop you will also see medicine you will also see bushers he's also selling meat in the same big shop some <laughs> others are selling you know clothes some other are selling you know vegetables uh -huh. soup you know fruit uh -huh. so there is a it's a called traditionally classic you know supermarket uh -huh. and i found that so the community that when we are also getting medicine from this particular shops with the pregnant woman is dying you know and we don't understand you know what is the problem so when i went to that one you know together with our team we found that some of like they were selling medicine with their collar. For example, patients, when they were coming, you know, to the clinics, so they were asked to, the, to their private, you know, shop, traditional shop, where they were selling medicine, they were asking, can you give me uh, tablets, you know, with red color? <laughs> so the tablet with red colors uh, was coming, you know, 10 years back, that was a kind of painkiller. Uh -huh. But during the last seven years, that was antibiotic. Oh. So again, getting, you know, antibiotics wow. for pregnant women uh, <clears throat> as a painkiller medicine. <laughs> so that was another reason, you know, mm. for those high level of child mortality and also maternal mortality in that wow. area. And then we also found, then what we did, I think it was very interesting, you know, what we did, we developed a kind of local context package together with the health facility. When they asked, because that we don't have place, you know, uh, attached to the clinic, you know, for the worship. We to spoke with the community and we told them, well, let's come and build two room attached to the clinic, because you know there should be also a community contribution. If it is coming to the religious sport, so the health system was funded by the international community. So and also from the international community, we had no budget, no authority to use, you know, for the to to build a mosque. Uh -huh. So we spoke with the community. We told them, well, come build two rooms attached to the clinic. And the, during the day, we were using that one for the health education. And then Brilliant. we also ask, you know, the religious scholars and we train them, we tell them how important is also help from the religious perspective. So that that was another interesting thing. That's so great. there was a kind of real community engagements wow. and religious engagement hall. So during the day, we were using for health education, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, you know, in the afternoon, evening for the prayer. Uh -huh. During the night, for those pregnant women that they were coming from a very remote area, they were also spending, you know, night uh, in that two rooms. You know, one room was for male, the other was for female. And we were used, call it, you know, like maternity waiting room. Oh, so maternity that. waiting room, then for mosque, for health education, and you will not imagine how much we spend on that one, $10, I think. <laughs> because only in the, in the opening ceremony of those buildings, when that was completed by the community, we just did, gave, gave them a kind of suite, and then small thing also for the environment. And then I think that was something that we learned many things from that one. And then it was the same when I spoke with the religious scholar that how much money you are also getting, you know, from those pregnant women to provide them a kind of religious treatment. And he was telling me, well, we are getting, you know, $1. We told them, well, we will also pay you $1. When you receive any kind of complicated mothers in any kind of complicated, you know, uh, mothers with complicated disease or children with a complicated disease, 
give us a missed call. We will send you an ambulance. We will also give you one dollar. So in fact, you know, the religious scholar was getting two dollars, uh, one from the patient and also one from us, but they were playing an important role, you know, referring most of those complicated cases to our clinic. Wow. And it also happened the same. We, we spoke also with the private, with the private uh, pharmacy. We told them whenever you are having any kind of comp uh, mothers or children, you know, with a comp uh, complication, health complication, refer those cases to us. So how much you are getting, you know, when you sell, you know, those medicine on them. So they were telling me roughly $1. We told them, well, we will also pay you $1. So this project was mainly like connected through $1. So $1. <laughs> And even we were paying also the same. When I we spoke also with the traditional birth attendant, those old uh, women, traditionally trained, uh -huh. that they were playing important roles in the delivery. So when we spoke with them, so she was also telling me, well, roughly we are taking you know one dollars from the community to conduct that delivery. And we told them, well, we will also pay one dollar. Bring all those pregnant women and. Our midwife under your supervision will conduct the delivery at the health facility level, so at the clinical level. So and then, so most of those pregnant women that they were losing, you know, their life because of the complication at the community level because of the high infection. So we prevented that once by referring most of those cases, you know, uh, from the community to the health facility level. And then, what important things we started? We also started community ambulances. We give the number of ambulance to all those community influencers and provincial people, you know, like religious scholars, those private pharmacy that people were getting, you know, medicine from them, traditional healer, and then uh, traditional bed attendants. And we told them uh, that, well, when you see any kind of complicated cases, give us just missed call. So when to the miss call to the ambulances so whenever the ambulance receive an ms call they will call you back and they will speak to you so when we receive those patients at the end of the day your name will be registered and you will be getting also one dollar per referral so wow. through one dollar we were in fact able you know to connect you know most of those cases that we were missing you know with the community with the help facility level and it was also even the same that um uh, we also started something else, you know, very important, you know, at the health facility level and community level, mm -hmm. we had community mapping. Community mapping means we were, we are putting, you know, a number of family in a piece of papers in a different village and then how many houses are there, how many pregnant women are there, because in Afghanistan and many developing countries, we are also having community health workers. Mm -hmm. So community health workers, in fact, in every village, but there is between 100 to 150 family. There is male and female, you know, so one health post. So two in each health post, we are having, you know, two uh, health workers. One is male, the other is female. Uh -huh. So male and female, what they were doing, they were in fact putting all the census in their, their map that in this particular village, this is the number of pregnant women. This is the number of children under one, children under five, even TB suspected cases in those one. So after each three months to six months, they were like updating that data map. So at the community, uh, then at the health facility level, at the clinical level, we had, you know, the number that the target in our area, for example, how many uh, deliveries should be conducted, you know, in this month from that particular area. So at the end of each month, we were also checking, you know, the registration book of the clinic to see if we are really getting, you know, that number of people that are reflected also in their map, showing the, the same number. If not, then we were giving, you know, that list of defaulter to the community health workers. And then community health workers were informing family that, well, this month you are supposed to go to the clinics because of those antenatal care visit, because of those, uh, uh, let's say, vaccine, because of family planning, because of several other targeted yeah, mm -hmm. disease. So, but you have not been there, please go. And this is the, 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 the message from the clinic. So even when they were not coming on the second month, then we were also having, you know, come started a kind of community outreach. So we are we one midwife, one uh, vaccinators, doctors and nurse, they uh, in an ambulance, they were going and also visiting those pregnant women and also even children that they have not received uh, uh, immunizations, vaccine services to see, to check also their, let's say, uh, nutrition status, 
immunizations and even if there is any other complication that still children are also suffering from that one or maybe diarrheal disease or respiratory tract infections and others so mm -hmm. with this we were able and then they were doing you know even you know those providing those services at the community level in the house of those religious scholar even in the mosque or school so these these were some of the approaches that we were in fact able you know to cover you know maybe 100 percent of those population that they were in the need of the services in the beginning we were only like waiting you know at the health facility level you know the clinical doctors they were just thinking that well we are only responsible to provide services if people come to the clinic and we forgot those community engagement and apart from that there was also a very interesting thing when I ask from the community leaders that which kind of language problem you are having, in many parts of the world, sometimes there is also local terminology, and then we are also having medical terminology. Mm -hmm. In local terminology, and I exactly remember that thing, when I ask, you know, from the patient that which part, which kind of health problem you are having, and she was telling me, I have chest pain. And the other was telling me, well, I have abdominal pain chest pain and abdominal pain in the local terminology and three different area was using for each other it was like in other way around uh -huh. so chest pain was a kind of abdominal in another area and other area it was chest pain in the third one you know abdominal was using you know for the chest pain and so there was several others you know local terminology wow. that really our doctors could not properly understand that one and then we just identify this local hundred terminologies you know that are, were very necessary also for the medical staff to understand in order to properly, you know, diagnose them. For the diagnosis, prescription of proper medicine. So that local terminology training also help us a lot to remove, you know, the distance in terms of communications between patients and also doctors. Wow. And the other important thing, <laughs> sometimes they were telling us, well, we don't want to see, you know, this white gown because white gown is not very good in our culture. You know? huh. And when we change, you know, the color of the gowns, <laughs> from white gown to gray gown was well the, the main concept of the health aids or clinics or public health is to provide services to the community that are acceptable to them mm -hmm. so no matter you can change you know the color of the gowns white gowns were gray gowns and even the color of the clinics they, they were not very happy to see the white colors and then we even changed the color of the clinic you know so it was like painted with a gray color <laughs> in order to be acceptable to the clinic and apart from that we also involved community in the planning of the clinics we told them well these are the your clinics so whatever you need we will be more than happy, you know, to provide, you know, the service that you need. So if you think these are not necessary, then we will totally remove them, you know, like it's a kind of giving ownership, you know, to the communities. Mm -hmm. And then that ownership always help us and also to protect, you know, the clinics also whenever there was a kind of uh, security challenges, you know, malicious mm -hmm. operations in the area by those people that they were against the government, you know, against the international community. So community always help us when we really tell them that, well, we are here, you know, to support you. That is great. Wow. <laughs> the, I, I have so many notes I've been taking during this. Um, first of all, that is, I, I just love the creativity and the innovation that you're able to bring to those kinds of challenges. And there is so oftentimes a problem with like not having an appreciation of community engagement and the fact that, you know, building, like having rooms to be able to, you know, just the, the, what in some sense might seem like a simple solution of adding a couple of rooms, but then that provides a place for prayer. It provides a place for women to stay that have gotten there over the night. It solves, you know, one, one, uh, uh, solution can, or one, in, one intervention can provide a variety of solutions to a variety of those kinds of problems. And then the whole economic aspect of it, of the, in some sense, probably hopefully affordable, but, you know, you were kind of uh, enrolling people as, uh, you know, triage experts to be able to, you know, get people to you and get people to you promptly. And, and again, this whole engagement aspect of what's motivating to the people that if, if, it, if, if, if we have this problem that exists today, what can be done internally, respectfully, and some, you know, economically and somewhat, uh, you know, creatively to be able to do that. And, ha you know, there's so often times, as you probably well know, the um, just asking those simple questions like the, the um, 
uh, going from a white uh, gown or, or, or lab coat or whatever to the gray is brilliant. I mean, it's just those simple little kinds, in some sense, simple kinds of things, but, but oftentimes there's such a hubris of who the providers are or who's in charge to not stop and take a moment and be able to engage with those in the community and those they want to work with. So I just, I think that, that that's so creative. That's so brilliant. Thank, thank you for sharing all that. That is, again, my tip of the hat and kudos to you. That's, that's wonderful. So were you still, were you involved um, uh, there during the time of, of the COVID outbreak or had you left Afghanistan at that point? I was, I, uh, I was involved like, uh, uh, I was providing a technical support to the Afghan government. Okay. Probably you have seen one of my open letter, I think it was published in Arab news. Mm -hmm. And so there was also another direct uh, another open letter to the president of Afghanistan. And uh, that was published in one of the Afghans, famous Afghans, you know, a newspaper. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very strange, you know, what happened? What was the reason why I did that one? Let me tell you something about that one. Uh -huh. I was following, you know, the Afghan COVID-19 response plan regularly. And usually I was coming, you know, to the media and I was discussing regularly with the media, providing a kind of technical support to the Afghan government through media. Mm -hmm. I was... Even I remember in one day, I was in three different TV or four different TV. Wow. Because in Afghanistan, number of TVs are more. Even I think it's more than the, the we are having here in UK. Uh -huh. So in that small country. So then what happened? I was following, you know, that one. And at some instance, I was taught maybe uh, the president of the country is not really following, you know, the media because he was the one who was taking, you know, the lead of the res national response. He was the chairman of the national COVID-19 uh, national response committee. Mm -hmm. And then I, when I found that, well, several things is like missing. We are missing, you know, more opportunities uh, uh, in Afghanistan. So then I wrote a kind of open letter, you know, at night. Uh, to the president of Afghanistan, and that was published in one of the famous news paper in Kabul. Mm -hmm. And then it was very strange. The second day, I was approached, you know, by the presidential office, and they were telling me, "Well, the director is speaking to you in, in our culture." So the president means, you know, it's a kind of if you translate it directly, it's like the general director is speaking to you. I thought maybe which general director? There are several general directors. Mm -hmm. And when, then I understood to tell that's the president. So the president appreciated that response wow. uh, comprehensive, you know, later. Uh -huh. And then he was telling me, well, please send us, you know, the comprehensive plan. We will also try to adjust our plan and see how much also that could also reduce, you know, those opportunity that we are still missing you know and i mentioned clearly there that well some of the skill that we can convert challenges to opportunities so that later uh, help us a lot so based on that later i think there was significant changes even at the leadership of the minister of public health so some people were removed from their position uh -huh. and then the national COVID 19 response plan was also revised adopted and very contextualized, you know, so in every area and many, it was not only, you know, the Minister of Public Health, you know, to be responsible, you know, so other line ministry was also, uh, was were also included, you know, in this uh, committee. And then we also taught, you know, that well, private sector is also one of the important component, you know, partners, you know, for the government. So private sector were in, involved, uh, representative of the private sector, you know, many, they were also involved of the part of that committee. Mm -hmm. And so, this letter helped us a lot. And then I was also asked, well, if I can also write, maybe summarize that one and uh, write it and send it to one of the English, you know, uh, newspaper. And then I was approached, you know, by Arab News. I think they were based in Pakistan, you know, so they told me, well, can you write it, summarize it, you know, and 800 words, you know, we mm -hmm. will be also able, you know, to publish that one. So then I was very fortunate that was also published in uh, Arabic. So that helped a lot also oh, in bet. different area yeah specifically those uh, area that that was not uh, totally included in the plan and then we were missing and also some of the uh, people some of these partners that they were really responsible uh, to provide you know logistic support technical support but they were also not part of this national response committee for example you oh, who was uh, responsible you know for the national for the technical support uh -huh. unfortunately in that initial plan 
they were not part of that national committee unicef was responsible you know to provide logistical support also and that was all they were also uh, like unicef was also not included in that one so missing 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 and then blaming you know only the minister of public health that they are not able you know to full uh, fill you know some of the expectation of the community in the government you know so mm-hmm. that was something you know like misunderstood and later help us a lot to be to make things you know very clear to everyone yeah it's you know it's it's hard enough i mean here you know i'm looking at it from a very jingoistic you know uh us based kind of perspective and there's such you know complications and diversity and and division and you know the science hasn't caught up with you know how things mutate and you know things change and it's a very you know fluid dynamic kind of thing and i would just think it'd be so amplified with you know different um languages and different you know kinds of circumstances and different levels of resources and things so it's i i can imagine that just trying to to shepherd that and manage that and, and getting everybody kind of moving in the same direction is is quite the challenge so were you doing this were you already in the uk when this was happening or were you still in afghanistan when this was these letters no no i was in uk i i I was in UK okay. and I was also in a, one of the consulting position in Islamabad, Pakistan, you know, Got it. with one of the international organizations. But still, I was keeping my eyes also open, you know, on of Afghanistan. Course. Yeah. At the time, you know, I was trying also to provide a kind of, you know, support in different way that I could also do it. That's good. Well, and again, obviously, it's, you know, it's been heard and it's been appreciated. So... Can you, I don't know if, how much you know, I know very little about it, that's why I'm asking, but um, do you know how things are, are, you know, is there a Ministry of Public Health functioning now under Taliban rule? And do you know how things are going these days, just in general, or, or in particular with COVID-19? Well, I think the question is very important, you know, and I would be delighted, you know, to, to give a kind of overview, you know, what happened today uh-huh. and how that current, you know, responses could be also controlled. Unfortunately, like I mentioned in the beginning, 75% of the Afghanistan health system budgets was defended on foreign aid, either you know, uh, USID, mm-hmm. uh, World Bank or European commissions, you know, we also had different small or big donors. But with the uh, 15th of August change in the uh, local in the government of Afghanistan. So the international community stopped their uh, funding. Mm-hmm. So that also affected very significantly the health sector budget. So uh, unfortunately, the current health system is just in the verge of collapse. Oh. Despite the fact that there is small, small support, commitment also from the United Nations, some commitment also from these different, you know, government, UK, US government. So mm-hmm. also under the humanitarian support, the health system is also receiving, you know, uh, some uh, level of support, but not the same to maintain, you know, the operation of the health system All as right. it was before the 15th of August. Gotcha. So, and, and, and what we are also thinking, I discussed the same thing also at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in UK, that, well, if it is possible for the international community to go beyond the narrow scope of the humanitarian response in order to protect, you know, the investment of the last two decades. Mm. There are there are enough, you know, investment in different sectors. A kind of foundation is there. Mm-hmm. But now with the scope of work of the humanitarian support, they are only providing, you know, a kind of, you know, life-saving support. What, what with this life-saving support, you know, either if it is food or if it is something, and also like medicine and also other. So with this, we may not be able, you know, to protect the real investment. The real investment also need a kind of operational support yeah. and some support also for the maintenance. So our request from the international community is to be a little bit flexible and to give, you know, more chance, you know, for those humanitarian organizations that they are working in Afghanistan to cover some of those operation and maintenance of the real foundation that we are having in different, you know, public sector. If it is Ministry of Public Health, if it is Kabul Municipality, if it is uh, Kabul, you know, if it is also higher uh, education, Minister of Higher Education, Minister of Education, or Public, or Minister of Public Affairs. So they need a kind of operational mm-hmm. support budget for the operational and also for the maintenance. I know it will be very difficult for the international community to give that fund also to the Taliban while they are not recognized, you know, so they are not part of this 
like a kind of recognize or legitimate government for the international community yeah. so we are also thinking that as long as you know the international community is already involved in, in providing you know, a kind of humanitarian support so with the with the exceptional or maybe with the expansion of some scope of work and to give more chance also to the international community to, to protect at least you know the investment by providing you know a kind of operational and maintenance support and give that chance also to the humanitarian organization to cover that one as well so yeah. this will help us maybe with with 10 percent of the uh, maintenance cost we will be able to protect you know 90 percent of those investment that yeah was done also supported also with the international community during the last two decades I think that's a good point. I read that, um, you know, and, and this gets well beyond my <clears throat> appreciation of the how the uh, mechanics of all this works, but that the U.S. Treasury Department issued, started issuing recently special licenses so that some of the international aid could, you know, flow back into Afghanistan. And I would hope that that could be foundational to what you're talking about, about, you know, getting those things put back into place and, and operational, because it is, it's so systemic. I mean, any one area that's, you know, overemphasized, you know, creates a deficit in the other, and any deficit in any area can, you know, conspire to just make things horrible. And I would imagine, I mean, it's it's sort of an irony to me being a kind of a, a, a data nerd is, and I appreciate that you maybe share that as well, too, in terms of epidemiology, but I would imagine, too, that, you know, we're going to see unfortunately probably some weaknesses back with maternal and child mortality and morbidity we're probably going to see you know a variety of things ripple you know over the course of the next few years and and some weakening of programs that you know just because they can't be sustainable without that kind of support but do you do you foresee there's any kind of epidemiological um, surveillance or anything like that that we keep an eye on these kinds of things of morbidity and mortality or maternal health or some of the things that you've been involved in historically? I think it's very important, you know. So let me answer uh, this question at, in a different, from different uh, aspect. Okay. First, the impact of the current humanitarian crisis in immediately and also in matter on the Western world, including US, UK, the whole you know, world. So uh, the whole world will not be protected if the current humanitarian crisis go the way that it's going on, unfortunately, today. So from three different perspectives. First, as you mentioned, you know, this Afghanistan is unfortunately having, you know, an estimated 12,000 HIV positive cases. Mm. With this 12,000, we were only able, you know, to say, to uh, diagnose around 3,000, roughly 3,000. Mm -hmm. Uh, positive cases. Out of this 3,000, only around 1,200 are registered for the treatment. So the remaining are just in the community. And we also have different level of services like harm reduction services, which play an important role to control, you know, the prevalence mm -hmm. of the expansion of the number of HIV. So now we are not having that kind of humanitarian, or sorry, these harm reduction services. And even the register patient uh, for the treatment HIV, they are also not receiving you know, regular medicine. Mm -hmm. So that could be another factor that suddenly the number of HIV cases in the country will be increased. And when people are also coming you know, out of Afghanistan, they could also easily transfer those cases also to the other part of the world. Sure. Second one, in Afghanistan, we also have multi uh, TB drug resistant cases, you know. Oh, gee. Call it. Uh, there are so many cases of positive TB that they are resistant against the medicine. So that number is also in very high number. I think it's 2,500 cases. So that case, so today, those already diagnosed MDR cases, multi drug resistant TB cases, they are also not receiving, you know, medicine. And so that could also give chance to spread, you know, those infected TB cases are resistant with drugs. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, the current positive TB cases, let's say it could be around 10,000. So this 10,000, they are also not receiving regularly medicine. So if when patients are not receiving, you know, regularly even their TB medicine, that could be converted, you know, with this multi-drug resistant TB. And that is why Afghanistan could be a happy center, you know, also for this several infectious disease. The same also for COVID-19. Unfortunately, the coverage of the vaccine in Afghanistan for COVID is also very low. 
we don't have proper diagnostic services we don't have you know uh, proper you know treatment center in afghanistan and it is also the same nobody is taking care of those preventive measures so and w so is also saying that no one is safe until everyone is safe mm-hmm. so well if we listen to the united nation then if afghanistan is not safe then it means world is not safe yeah. and i hope you know the international community could also pay attention to that one i clearly discussed this one also with the american public health association president i think you know just uh, one one and a half month back uh-huh. and i clearly tell them well they can also make their noises in us that where afghanistan could be a center focal center also for many infectious disease and then people when they are also going to us and uk or maybe different part of the world could easily transfer most of those infectious disease because it's spreadable you know so they can easily spread it right and then coming back you know and then looking to the different other perspectives so when afghans are like unfortunately these days they are suffering from starvation you know starvation is very common 22 million people today they need immediate humanitarian support wow and we have been grateful for the united nation in many country that they are providing you know kind of humanitarian support but these this these are not enough for the afghan so that's why today if you follow the news there are many afghans unfortunately fleeing the country going through illegal you know way mm-hmm. coming to europe or going to other countries through illegal so that could also destabilize you know the countries because when the, these people come here you know illegally mm-hmm. so either they are losing you know their life in the way or creating you know security problem for country and the last important things we are also having well million afghans i think it should be millions now millions are uh, afghan diaspora in us uk is in many country now we are also having a kind of mental problem mm-hmm. stress depression because every day i'm receiving a message from afghanistan that well my families my kids are dying because we don't have enough food so that l- increasing level wow. of mental disorders let's yeah. say you know kind of depression anxiety mm-hmm. even could cause some kind of you know suicide here in uk us and also other part of the country because if some part of their family is dying in afghanistan so listening every day that message is that my family is dying please help me and then sometimes they may not be able you know to provide them enough support so that could cause you know maybe very high load of you know those uh, mental or mental health you know challenges in mm. the country and complication of mental health is you know sometimes it's very clear could cause also even you know suicide in different part of the world wow so that's why we are thinking that well the international community at least could provide you know enough support to the afghan inside afghanistan at least you know to prevent to to protect also their country also from this negative impact that i already mentioned yeah it really uh, i think it speaks you, you make a variety of very poignant uh points in the it speaks to the not just globalization but just the interconnectedness of of all these kinds of things and and indeed you know the the humanitarian crisis is not ended in some ways i think it's you know obviously being amplified with with the current circumstances and you um you wrote in a recent article i read in the lancet that was published in the lancet with some colleagues around these kinds of issues of the humanitarian crisis and urgent health needs and things um i i think it's you know i tip my hat to you again for this and and doing that and and bringing it uh, out there but um what what spurred you and your colleagues to write this just to be able to you know you found good like once there's a you know people that listen and and media that hears things to get this but then you know the lance it's a you know fairly you know uh, scientifically focused audience highly respected one of the top journals i think in the world but what what spurred you to write that and and what did you hope to have happen as a result of that I think there was three main reason. First, I knew, you know, the inter- the level of the international uh, support in Afghanistan. So, if international support you know, stop in Afghanistan, what would happen? You know, so this level of humanitarian crisis that we are having today, we projected that once, even on the first day of 15 August. So that's why my first interview was was with the Guardian. night 
8th of 16th of August, that what will happen, how much, you know, it will create, you know, problems to the Afghans, to the community, to the international communities, you know, what will be the level of this humanitarian crisis, you know, why we will be having humanitarian crisis with this change. And so, and then I was also approached, I think, you know, by almost all media in Europe, in U US, and so they were also very happy because when they saw, you know, that interview published in Guardian on 16th of August, just a few hours after, you know, the collapse. And so then uh, th this was one site. In the second one, I was also daily receiving, you know, messages, you know, also from Afghanistan. And that, well, the country is just going, you know, to be in a very difficult situation. So we need to inform, you know, the international community. So those kind of messages, pressure also from colleagues, friends in Afghanistan, and then my level of understanding, you know, from these financials mechanism funded uh, of the Afghan government funded, you know, with a huge support from the international community. So this one, and then we, I have been also very grateful, you know, for the international colleagues in different parts of the world, when they were also like watching the, the interviews, you know, reading, you know, some news in different uh, newspapers. So they were also encouraged, you know, they pushed me, well, let's come and also write a kind of article. So the first mm -hmm. article that we published, I think it was the first one, uh -huh. first week that we published in Lancet, and then we also did an interview with the Lancet, it was a kind of podcast, and then another article at the um, uh, British Medical Journal, uh -huh. and so still I was contributing in many other discussion, different parts of the world, you know, at least to see how much we can also uh, reduce the level of stress, tensions, level of humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan with the support of the international community. We are, have been really grateful, you know, for the uh, support of the United Nations, different, you know, Western countries, including UK, US, uh, but still that level of support that we, uh, our people are receiving in the crowd is not enough. And we unfortunately just today that I'm discussing with you, over 1 million children are just starving. You know? oh, and gosh. over 1 million children are just in the risk of dying. Mm. And every day, the children are dying in Afghanistan because they don't have access to food. So I think that message need to be uh, clarified to the world that well. And then unfortunately, very unfortunately, the de facto authorities in the ground, sometimes they are also not sharing, you know, the real challenges of the Afghans, you know, mm. they think, well, if we share, you know, the challenges, then the world will not recognize us. Mm. Recognition of the local, you know, uh, authority is not our interest. Our main interest is also to protect our people to see, you know, Afghanistan again, again, you know, uh, happy Afghanistan, fresh Afghanistan, bright with the bright futures, you know, and to see how we can also get, you know, chance that uh, those Afghans that they are leaving today, Afghanistan, are returned back. The biggest challenge in the history of the country mm. that we are having today it is brain drain. Mm -hmm. I know many people. Unfortunately, most of those uh, people educated in the Western world during the last uh, two decades are either they already left or they are leaving. So this was, you know, the main uh, brand, you know, like human resources that they were playing important role. And if you remove all those uh, skillful people, educated peoples, understanding, you know, the world, understanding, you know, the technology, how to use them, you know, how to develop, you know, like uh, how to develop, you know, money system mm -hmm. also in the country. And for everyone, uh, the, 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 these were the main people, you know, used, you know, for the operations of the current system. So this... And, 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 and just to assure you, once, once people left the country and they settle somewhere, it will be very difficult for them to convince them to go back to Afghanistan. Sure. So that's why our expectation from the international community is also to provide enough support and hire also those people that they are still in the country through those international organizations that they are providing, you know, different level of support and to create a kind of job for them and protect them and so with their protections, you know, if Afghanistan is safe, the world will be safe. If mm. it is not safe, then we remember, you know, the story of 9-11. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I'm scared that maybe that will again, you know, happen. Yeah. Because the world is unfortunately, being very unfortunately, not paying, you know, full attention, you know, yeah. to the Afghan, to Afghanistan, you know, to protect and you know, also those negative impact also on the world and also inside Afghanistan. 
Yeah. Oh, good points. All right. Well, this is this has been really a, a wonderful conversation. I have just a couple of other things. If you're good for time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great, great. Did I in, in doing my research? Um, am I correct in thinking that uh, you may have a book in the works? Is that right? I am working. Yes, I am working on a very interesting book. That was also in light of those innovation that I had also in the health system in Afghanistan and others. Uh huh. Good. Uh huh. Uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. That, so the book is also very interesting, you know. So it is like you know why innovation is very important in rural development. So without innovation, we may not be able, you know, to see, you know, most of in most country rural area, you know, to have a kind of balanced development. Mm -hmm. And it, it was very interesting because in many developing countries, unfortunately, there is no balanced development, you know, because of different reasons, either political, city, like, you know, the budget they are, they are allocating also for different provinces, different cities are influenced also by the politician. So if you don't have strong politician, you may not be able, you know, if you are living in a very remote area, in a budget for their development, and second thing, human resources are different, you know, sometimes if you allocate, you know, equal budget to them, so an even equal budget could not produce equal development mm. because of the <laughs> lack of resources there, you know, poor resources and lack of, you know, mm -hmm. interest, you know, lack of awareness of, uh, about the public service, you know, those stuff. So, uh, so my role is also to, see, I hope, you know, I will be able to complete read this book in the next uh, one and a half year because it's a very comprehensive book and I hope that I will be able to speak with you once we launch that book. You got a deal. I think that would be great. I just, I feel like a lot of the issues you talk about, it would be great to have it in a book. I mean, you've you've taken a very um, scientific research aspect and look at looking at it in terms of, you know, identifying problems and, and trying solutions and seeing the effect of those solutions. And I've had, as you were talking about it, it made me think of, um, like I was doing some work years and years ago in South Africa, and we were working collaboratively with uh, traditional healers. And in South Africa, if memory serves, there was like a, um, 20 different national languages, you know, so it was sort of like this, you know, just Tower of Babel, you know, trying to get people to properly communicate and making sure that, like, I, I loved your point about, you know, chest pain and stuff about how that can be, someone might think that's just, you know, universal and specific and, and no it's not or the red pill and how that's changed I think those kinds of stories kind of really bring to light a um, uh, you know an eye-opening kind of experience for healthcare providers and you know people in, in medical training and supervisors and things so I think your book would be a, a welcome tome to be able to help you know, in, create do those kind of creative things in rural and resource poor kinds of areas so well, again, you've been you've been so generous with your time today. Are there some ways that uh, people in the audience, interested listeners, can be of help or learn more about your work? Or uh, what are good ways? I know that uh, you and I connected via LinkedIn, but uh, if, if people want to know more about what you're up to or, or provide some kind of support, what are good ways to do that? Well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity that at least, you know, I can also share, you know, some of my lesson learned and also learn also from the audience. And I'm sure, you know, once you uh, share that uh, podcast, there will be also some sort of feedback and also from the people, you know, from mm -hmm. the audience, respected audience. Yeah. So through that, we will be also, I will be also personally learning a lot of stuff from them and I'm definitely sure. So I... Thank I what I'm thinking, let's open uh, the other discussion, you know, for the audience. Okay. When we are also, they are hearing, you know, uh, the podcast, and I'm sure they will be putting a lot of questions. And I will be more than happy, you know, to provide, you know, to connect it also with the audience. Great. To see in which level, you know, we can also help each other. Because it's a globalization, you know, so the world is like a small village now. That's very so true. So in the small village, what we need to be connected. So network is important, you know, we need to share, you know, the, the good messages, at least, you know, very helpful messages with each other that we learn from each other. And otherwise, it would have not been possible for me to come uh, a child growing, you know, up, you know, in a uh, refugees camp selling waters. And then when I got, you know, a kind of promotion, then I started selling vegetable and fruit <laughs> and was not able to have, you know, uh, 
sandal for very long time you know only sorry, sorry uh, shoes for long time wearing you know sandal so this would have not been possible for me to come here without network i think network is always helping us so this was the feedback of colleagues friends everybody's to encourage me also to help me to support me during different project you know that i reached here and this is for me it's like a kind of beginning of the journey so my future journey will be broader because i learn a lot from my less from my work you know during the last two decades and also from both education so uh, as you mentioned that uh, i'm lecturer at the university of london so we'll be moving you know to cambridge where i can also learn you know new things from the universities professors from peers colleagues and from students you know because that university is one of the best university in the world yeah i congratulations think, again by the way that was I, I didn't emphasize that thank enough that's much. wonderful that is so wonderful yeah uh, well, so thank you very much. I think so let's leave you know those questions maybe to the audience if okay. they are having any things, so we can stay together and maybe in the future we can also come again you know to record a different podcast. I would love to have you on again for a round two. That would be great and and absolutely a lot of the um, uh, sites that uh, this conversation will show up on will be LinkedIn and will be Medium and will be YouTube, a variety and Facebook. We've got a, a group there. Actually, two different ones this might be applicable for, um, and academia.edu and a number of other places where people can um, comment and engage with you. So I'll send uh, you, hopefully everyone, <laughs> all the audience might have those links anyway. They come out, but uh, you can just uh, you know Google whatever your favorite source is of this show. And um, you know if, and obviously you too, Dr. Hakmal, to be able to respond back to them and connect with them and, and you know be additive to the work that you're doing and do that networking that is so critical and important to this kind of work. I totally agree very full-heartedly with that. So thank you again for the time. Uh, appreciate the time difference and, and taking your time out of late in the day for you to be able to do this in the UK. And I look forward to what comes next. Uh, do let me know how the book goes and uh, the work that you do is so important. And again, congratulations on the Cambridge appointment. Good to be on with you. Living a Life in Full is a production of Stout Media, a subsidiary of Gordian Knot, LLC. Assistant producer, Gracie Wong. Music, Dan O'Brien. Executive producer and host, Dr. Chris Stout. To learn more, stop by our website at Life in Full for show notes. And please recommend us to your friends and subscribe on your favorite platform. And as for the obligatory disclaimer, this podcast is for general information uses only. It does not constitute the practice of psychology, medicine, nutrition, or other professional health care services, including the giving of medical or psychological advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, I take conflicts of interest seriously. For all of my disclosures as well as show notes, please see livingalifeinfull.org slash podcast and my LinkedIn profile. Thanks, and until next time.